So let's real quickly finish off the clasin. So we know the clasin is the reaction of two equivalents of an ester. So everything you've talked about right now has been a homoclasin. So one ester becoming the enolate and attacking another equivalent of the parent ester. And that gives us a product like this. And clasins are really, really reversible. They go forward in the clasin, but they can also go backwards in the retroclasin. And this can be very, very troublesome uh, in some cases. For instance, if you have a, if you have a clasin product uh, that does not have the acidic hydrogen, there is no thermodynamic driving force state to the product. So in cases like this, under thermodynamic sodium methoxide and ethanol conditions, you can form the Claisen product, but because there's no acidic hydrogen, it just can go back to the stellar materials to be a retro -clasin. So you can have a messy reaction with not very good yield in a number of different products. However, if you do have a Claisen product, in this case it does have the acidic hydrogen, then under the Claisen conditions of sodium methoxide, the acidic hydrogen adjacent to both carbonyls can be quickly deprotonated uh, to give us the enolate, which is going to be the thermodynamic resting place of the Claisen rearrangement. And since we have a thermodynamic racing, uh, thermodynamic driving force in the way of the steep nation, that's going to drive the reaction forward. So when you have the acidic hydrogen between the two carbonyls, pKa of 12, the reaction is driven forward by the deprotonation. When you don't have the acidic hydrogen, as in as is this case, uh, where you have two substituents out of the ester alpha carbon, we do not have the thermodynamic driving force. And so it's gonna go back and forth, back and forth. It's gonna kind of, you know, it's gonna you know, still live at home with its parents and all that fun stuff. Sorry, bad joke, I'm one of the topics are in. I lived with my parents when I went to SDSU, but <laughs> nonetheless. It's going to be going back and forth and just kind of being alone. So we won't get a good reaction. Whereas uh, in this case, we will get a good reaction if we have the thermodynamic driving force. So that's the key idea with the Claisen is if you have if the product has an acidic hydrogen, the Claisen is going to form this and it's going to be a good reaction. If it does not have the acidic hydrogen, it cannot form that, and it's going to be a lousy reaction. Yes. Um, if there's an error for that first reaction. Going, when it takes the hydrogen yeah. and the air points up, then you have the double bond on the other side. Oh, so, okay. Good point. Uh, that's fine. That's perfectly valid. But to say, through like this enolate, let's be consistent. But of course, it's, it's a complete resonance, right? So the enolate can go to the ketone or it can go to the ester. But since the ester is a slight electron donating group because of the ethoxy group, it's going to favor the enolate here over the enolate in the ester, but they're both reasonable. There's no reason you can't draw both. So, in general, under thermodynamic conditions, so sodium methoxide and ethanol, you can only form products that have the alpha hydrogen in the product. If they don't have the acidic alpha hydrogen between both carbonyls, it's not going to work. So, let's talk about something else. So we've only shown places between two of the same molecules. What do you think a clasin between two different esters would look like? So, let me draw the other guy in a different color. I've described that like uh, you know, Sorry, several, I several times. So if it has no 
alpha hydroacidic hydrogen, it can't form the enolate. And if it can't form the enolate, it doesn't have the electron, or that doesn't have the thermodynamic driving force. So it doesn't have the acidic hydrogen, it's going to be a lousy reaction because it doesn't have the thermodynamic driving force. Uh, just, uh, what is the, it says lousy EA, what's, I just Oh, EQ, lousy equilibrium. Oh. Lousy equilibrium. Oh. All right. Lousy equilibrium, and it's fair to say no reaction or bad reaction. Sorry, I didn't get the question. I, I, I thought you were asking about the chemistry, not my messy handwriting. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so if you have two different esters, uh, would this be a clean reaction or a messy reaction? Will we get one product, two products, four products? What will happen? Under typical sodium with oxide conditions. Thumbs up or thumbs down in this reaction? I see one thumbs down. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, so thumbs down. So what will happen under typical thermodynamic conditions, we can form four different products. We can form this guy reacting with itself. And it's got an alpha hydrogen, so it's got a driving force, so it's good. We can drive this guy reacting with itself. And it's got the acidic hydrogen, so it's good. We can draw this guy attacking this guy. So this guy from the enolate attacking this guy. And it's got an acidic hydrogen, so it's good to form. And then we can draw this guy attacking this guy. And this guy has an acidic hydrogen, so it's good. So we have four reasonable products, and there's nothing that's going to favor any of them. Nothing. So we'll form a mixture of four products. So thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs down. Uh, not very good. Whenever you form multiple products, like four, it's always a bad day in the lab. Forming multiple products is not fun. So this is not an issue. This is not an option. So if you want to form cross Clayson products or heteroclasin between two different esters, these conditions aren't the way to go. There are some tricky things you can do, but they're not the real answer. So the tricky things you can do is you can take an ester and then have your second ester not have any alpha hydrogen. Like so. So for this Clayson, this guy plus this guy, how many products can we have? Two products. This attacking itself, and then this attacking this. Are there any things we can do to make it favor this attacking this? Limit the amount of Exactly. Or add extra of this. So if you want to do a homo, sorry, a hetero Clayson, what you want to do is use something like 10 equivalents of your ester that has no alpha hydrogens. And so then the equilibrium, because you have more of the no alpha hydrogen ester, will favor this forming the enolate and attacking the ester with no alpha hydrogens. So that works. But is, it, is this really satisfying synthetically? 
This is kind of just cheating the system. So be aware that's, how you, that's one way to do a Gleason, but it's not the universal theory to everything. It's not 42. Uh, it turns out for the cross Clayson, the 42 answer is actually LDA. Particularly, you use LDA to freeform enolate. <coughs> so going back to this reaction, if you want to make the product of this enolate attacking this ester, what you actually do is You take your ester, you throw in LDA first, and this will quantitatively form your enolate. So it quantitatively forms your enolate out of every single molecule of that ester. And then what you do is once you've quantitatively formed your ester, then you throw your enolate, then you throw in your other ester. And since this is ready to enolate, there's going to be no competition to which enolate you form. This is going to stay as enolate, and it's just going to attack this. And dear Clayson. And give you only one possible cross product. Answer so this will give your product plus ETO minus, which will just quickly deprotonate this to give us a thermodynamic six so it can't go backwards. So the answer to doing a real cross Clayson product is not using these difficult thermodynamic Clayson conditions. It's using more simple, if you will, mechanistically at least, kinetic conditions, where you preform your first enolate that you want to attack, and then once you have your quantitative formation of your enolate, then you add in the next ester. And that way you only get one product. So it's a good way. In fact, if you want to make a cross enolate, a cross place in product, this is, that's the best way to go by uh, using LDA. And there's one more thing you can, you can get away with LDA. And that is, with LDA, we don't have to worry as much about the retro Clayson happening. The reason being, when you use LDA, you're getting away from sodium ethoxide and you're getting away from uh, ethanol. Which means the only ethanol that sodium ethoxide that forms in a reaction is the stuff that leaves in the Gleason bond forming step. And so instead of being swimming in ethanol and sodium ethoxide, which can add into the carbonyl, you only have one equivalent of sodium ethoxide. And so what that means is, since there's such little thermo uh, sodium ethoxide, the retroclasin is going to be a very, very, very minor side product because there's very little ethoxide to force the retroclasin. So getting away from the retroclasin, what do you think that means? It means we can make glacin products with no alpha hydrogens, with LDA. So if you want to make a Clayson product with no alpha hydrogen, you want to do it well. Use lithium diacepropyl amide, which will form the enolate quantitatively. Then 
Then add in a second equivalent of your ester. In this case, we'll do the same one. But you don't have to do the same one. It will still work. And we'll, we'll do your placement. Okay, but now, because instead of swimming in sodium dioxide and ethanol as your solvent, you only have one equivalent. And so what that means, once again, is your clasin, retroclasin equilibrium is going to be totally shifted to the clasin product. Because there's not <coughs> enough sodium dioxide to affect the equilibrium to go the other way. And so then, you know, the major product we get out will be the Placing product without the alcohol. So if you want to make something like this, the answer is LDA. Lithium diisopropyl out. <coughs> so now that brings us to the aldol reaction. Yes. Just a minor note. Did you mean to have the sodium ethoxide on the top there? For that top reaction there? Uh, that for this one? No. Top, the top one? Over the reaction there? Uh, top one here? In, below that. In black. In black. Yeah, right there. Right there where you left. Yeah, right there. So in ethanol, well, sodium ethoxide right here, right? Did you mean to have that on the top? There? Uh, that, you mean, yeah, it doesn't matter what's on top, what's on bottom. Same thing. Okay. But it's, the sodium dioxide is still here, so it's still uh, noting that, that it's in the <coughs> Okay, so that brings us to the aldol reaction. We've already discussed the aldol reaction in this class briefly on what, once Monday. But uh, just to refresh you, uh, there's two versions of the aldol reaction. The acidic version, all right, the acidic version, where we form, we take our carbonyl, we throw an acid, and of course, under acidic conditions, a carbonyl is going to go into its enol tautomer. So tautomerization. And then the enol is going to attack another equivalent of the, an aldehyde that's in the carbonyl or the keto form. You want to leave the aldehyde in a different color. And the fact that I chose red and black, I guess that's showing the skull spirit. So the enol will attack another from the aldehyde. giving us a alkoxide, but of course in this case, this is a no-brainer for an intramolecular, in, yeah, intramolecular proton transfer, because we have an O minus and an O plus. So we can grab this proton. Typically electron density back in the oxygen. They give us our first aldol product via the acidic mechanism.
And then of course, since we're under acidic conditions, uh, would we expect the aldol product to be in the aldol form, or we expect it to be in the enol aldol form? In all form, but of course, if you, if you draw it in this form, that's perfectly fine. Because uh, usually we assume some workup to get the final product, so if we worked it up, we would get uh, this product. But if we kept it under acidic conditions, it would actually exist in its in all form, which I'll just draw. So this is the acid catalyzed aldol. And I'm just going to box both because these are both reasonable products. They're tautomers, so they're pretty much the same molecule. They're the equivalent to each other. Uh, so the reason it's called the aldol is not because there's some British guy named Sir Aldol who discovered this reaction in the 50s, unfortunately. It's because the products have an aldehyde and an alcohol, aldol. Uh, you can also do aldols with ketones. So the aldol chemistry only works with aldehydes and ketones. But you can have aldehyde, aldehyde, ketone, 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 aldehyde, aldehyde, ketone. Any permutation of aldehyde attacking ketone or ketone attacking aldehyde will give you a valid aldol reaction. So once again, the aldol is a lot like the quasin, except for the fact that instead of attacking an ester with a leading group, it's attacking a aldehyde or ketone, which does not have a good leading group. <coughs> so that's why it stops the alcohol form. So with the clasin, we talked about having this big retro clasin uh, reaction going against the clasin. Do you think the aldol will have a retro aldol reaction that goes backwards? If you have a retro clasin, will we have a retro aldol? Considering the reactions are so similar? Yes. Absolutely. <coughs> so always be aware that we can have a retro aldol. I'm just going to redraw the proton. So I'm going to draw the retro aldol in orange. So the retro aldol is in orange. Aldol just being in reverse is breaking the bond we formed in the aldol and giving us back an equivalent of the aldehyde and an equivalent of the enol that attacked the aldehyde. So it's the direct reverse of the acid catalyzed aldol. And once again, it's just this electron density kicking down, causing this bond that we formed in the aldol to break and kick into this aldehyde to form the enol after it takes this proton. So kicking down here, breaking this bond, going into the enol. Let me draw it, let me draw it in the forward direction here because I'm getting some confused faces. So again, the retro aldo. You can think of it starting with the lone pair of electrons under acidic conditions, of course. Taking this proton, because in this electron density, you kick in here to form a double bond, and then causing this bond to break and kick into the enol form. also draw it, instead of having the electron density go directly into the pi system, we have this electron density just go straight to the carbon. And if you draw it like that, 
that would give us the a resin structure of this. Like this. So the minus charge is going into this carbon, but the carbon is really going to exist like this in the ketonal form because that's the better resonance structure. I'm getting a lot of confused faces, so that's what I'm trying to explain. Yeah. So is that one concerted step? Uh, yeah, that's the way it's set to occur. It, it, you know, with all concerted steps, if you don't, if you understand them by drawing stepwise, by all means. But in my opinion, it may be hard to draw this reaction stepwise. Uh, I think when I talk about the basic retro alder, I'll make the basic retro alder, so under basic conditions, it's just more stepwise mechanism. But under acidic conditions, it's usually just as concerted, taking this proton, kicking down here, kicking down here, kicking up here type of mechanism. Enol can do it, and enolate can do it. And in fact, an enolate would probably do it better because it's got more nuclear felicity because it's actually an anion rather than a neutral molecule. So enolates are more nuclear fluid than enols. And so what that means is under basic conditions, uh, that aldol reaction can also occur. So dressed with the clasin, we have two choices, uh, LDA or sodium methoxide. And so, sodium methoxide will give us thermodynamically controlled aldol reactions, whereas LDA will give us kinetically controlled. And just to show you an example of what I mean, as I said, we can also do aldols with ketones, and I'll show you an example with one ketone. Let's do a, a non-symmetrical ketone. So, if we use LDA, which enolate are we going to form? Kinetic. The kinetic. So, are we going to deprotonate one of these protons or one of these protons? Yeah, so the less substituted protons will deprotonate. So, we'll form this enolate. Like so. And the mechanism of the basic all in all is you take your enolate and form whichever way you formed, and then you throw in uh, your ketone or your aldehyde. Uh, for this aldol reaction, do you want to form a ketone or an aldehyde? Uh, do, do, you want, do you want this to attack a ketone or an aldehyde? Just say something random. Ketone, aldehyde. Ketone, okay. So I'm just going to draw acetone here. And so if you form this enolate from thermodynamic conditions, the basic aldol. We'll attack this. To give us this alkoxy. And of course, this is under basic conditions. If we want the alcohol out, we have to quench the reaction with what? Well, with an acid. And so the basic aldol is much simpler, right? You form your enolate, your enolate attacks a ketone or an aldehyde, just like you expect a nuclear final to attack a ketone or aldehyde. You get your alkoxide, you quench it, and you're done. So what the basic, what the, uh, Retro aldol under basic conditions is, is you 
form this alkoxide intermediate. And like I said, the basic retromolidol is much more stepwise. So you deprotonate to go back here, or it never gets protonated in the first place because you don't have acid. So when you have this alkoxide, the retromolidol is just NOB in red instead of black. These electrons kicking down. The bitter electron density in this, at this carbon, of course, this carbon is adjacent to a carbonyl, so it's just going to really go into the pi system, kicking this up to give us our enolate again and our ketone again. So again, it's electron density from the alkoxide kicking in, breaking this bond here, and then this electron density go into the pi system of the enolate. So I think a little bit more clear under basic conditions and acidic conditions. The key thing to remember is if an aldol or a clase can go forward, it can definitely go backwards. And so we just need to be clear of that. And so we usually need a thermodynamic driving force. Uh, in the case of the basic aldol, it's we quench the reaction with acid. Uh, before it can do a backwards reaction. So again, this would be a kinetic aldol. <laughs> so if we use sodium oxide and uh, ethanol, which enolate are we going to get? More substituted or less substituted enolate? The more substituted. So again, thermodynamic and sodium kinetics. Do you want me to add in an aldehyde or a keto? Aldehyde. Aldehyde. Let's do for aldehyde. And then, in this case, since we're under ethanol conditions, we don't necessarily need to add acid. But since we have ethanol around, there will be an equilibrium where the ethanol just protonates the alkoxide, and then we get our protonated product. Or just dry, and this side here. Dr. Yes. Uh, is there a reason you did stereochemistry or just? Uh, just because I realized with this example we form a chiral center. Okay. So I just wanted to prove a point that the aldol reaction can be used to make chiral centers. Okay. And again, in this class, all I'll ask would be stereochemistry question mark, meaning is there stereochemistry or is there not stereochemistry? Is it chiral or not chiral? Yeah. Me mechanism with uh, ketones? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, if you ever take acetone and you make it acidic, uh, you'll see some not as fun stuff happen because the acetone will actually polymerize. Uh, so, yeah, do this kind of all level mechanism. You don't have to force it, but you can. Uh, so again, basic enol uh, aldols and uh, acidic aldols. And so the aldol is a bit annoying in that in that you have the aldol 
where it stops at these alcohol at these alcohol products. But if you if you go under forcing conditions, so meaning you take your alcohol product and you heat it up, you can get another reaction, and that is called the aldol dehydration. So the, the most common way people do this is they do their aldol and they isolate the aldol product. And then they subject it to dehydration conditions, either acidic or basic in heat, to get the dehydrated product. Conversely, you can just run your aldol reaction hot and it will go all the way in the same step. So let me show you an aldol dehydration in two pots where we make our aldol product and then we do a dehydration. And then let me show it to you in one pot. So let's take this product we formed using the LDA chemistry. So all about dehydration. The aldol dehydration can occur under basic or acidic conditions. Under acidic conditions, the first thing that's going to happen is this is going to, is this is going to go into the enol tutter. the other top or two here, but I'm going to invoke a productive pathway. So we want the topper so that the double bond is pointing towards the alcohol, not pointing away. So there's no reason why you form this topper over the other, other than the fact that there's a thermodynamic driving force downstream in this mechanism. So you can form both, but the productive enolate is going to be here. And we're under acidic conditions. So we can draw an equilibrium where this alcohol gets protonated. And then this can just leave to give us a carbocation. In this case, it will give us a tertiary carbocation. So, you know, that's, that's definitely fair. So, pretty much, I'm setting up an E1 elimination, right? Actually, I haven't shown you guys what the aldol dehydrated product is yet, so. <coughs> so, when the water leaves, it gives us this carbocation that's adjacent to the double bond. So we have a carbocation that's tertiary allylic, so it's in conjugation with the double bond of the enolate. And so then what happens is we can throw this electron density from this double bond and go directly into the carbocation. They give us this protonated product. And of course we're in the water, so the water can grab this proton. give us our aldol dehydrated product, which is a double bond between the alpha carbon and its adjacent carbon, which we call a beta carbon. 
So an, all, an acid catalyzed aldol dehydration will go from the aldol product to this product with the double bond adjacent to it. And again, it just goes through uh, pretty much a E1 type elimination, an E1 type elimination from the enoch. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Again, the methyl group was just kind of like hood ornament. You know, nothing too important, but yes, I did. I was missing it. Uh, so this is the acid catalase dehydration. And normally, you get it to go, you just, you have to heat them a bit. You have to heat it a bit. But if you do it under acid conditions, you go through this E1 type mechanism to get the, uh, eat the aldol dehydrated product. We can also do this under basic conditions. It's more like an E2 type elimination. So you form the enolate. And of course, you're, you're kind of in competition with the retro aldol. But under these conditions, you do a retro aldol, you can do a forward aldol. So the retro aldol will just go back to the product of a normal aldol. And so then eventually, it will kind of go through this, be a kind of a thermodynamic sink. And then we do what's pretty much an E2 mechanism. Again, you have to heat these for it to go all the way. And so we just do an E2 mechanism now. <coughs> E2-like mechanism. Where the electron density from the enolate kicks in and kicks out OH minus. And remember, we're doing this under basic conditions, so under basic conditions it's okay to kick off OH minus. It's not okay to kick off OH minus under acidic conditions, of course. So again, we can do the dehydration part of the auto dehydration under acidic or basic conditions. We just need to heat it. And what that means is at elevated temperatures. Are we going to get the aldol product out or are we going to get the aldol dehydrated product out? We're going to the dehydrated product. So if you don't, if you, if you just want to do it in one step, you just heat up your aldol reaction and it will go all the way. the dehydrated product from forming an enolate of one, attacking the other, giving us our aldol product. And then since the basic dehydration conditions are similar, since the basic aldol conditions are similar to the basic dehydration conditions, as well as the acid aldol conditions are similar to the acid aldol reaction, for both the acid and basic aldol, if you heat it up, it's going to go all the way to the dehydration. So you don't have to separate the product out of your aldol reaction, you just heat it up and it will go all the way to the dehydrated product. 
So if you see an aldo reaction with heat, we're probably looking for the dehydrated product, not the aldo product. <coughs> and if you want, you can almost think of this product as a thermodynamic resting place. Because uh, it can't do, because obviously this can't do the retro aldo reaction. Finally, uh, just like you can do intramolecular glacins to form uh, various sized rings, you can do intramolecular aldols, particularly intramolecular aldol dehydrations, to form different rings. I do. That's already the ring. cases, it can get complicated because even though this is a symmetrical case, we can have this hydrogen attack this carbonyl, or we can have this carbon attack this carbonyl. And so what's going to happen? And the answer is the answer is it's going to do whatever forms the most stable ring. So if we form this enolate, I'm just going to draw the minus charge. So if we form the minus charge of this carbon, this will give us a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, a 5 number. Conversely, if we form the minus charge at this carbon, it will give us a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven number three. So what do you think is going to be thermodynamically more stable? The seven number three or the five number three? The five number three. And so I'll show you guys more examples after the test. Uh, this is probably a good stopping place. But if you do see an intramolecular aldol, I don't remember if you will or not, but just realize it's just going to favor the more stable ring system. And it's completely thermodynamically controlled. Because it can do an aldol and a retro aldol. All the and retro all the So we'll go to the more thermodynamically favorite ring system. So 5 over 7, 6 over 8, so on and so forth.